Hello, my name is Sam Goob and I'm just going to spend a few minutes going back to basics around the what and why object storage. So first, let's think about why object storage is becoming more relevant. So we've all heard the stats about data growth and we're well aware that the growth is mainly in unstructured content-based data, such as music, videos, documents and pictures, etc. So why is object storage better suited to this type of data? So if I think about this from a consumer perspective, so in my personal life as well as at work, I constantly access my music and I watch videos on, on the go, I'm on YouTube, I'm saving documents and I'm accessing them from all different devices. So from that perspective, when I think about what's important to me, these are the things that come to mind. The first thing is that I always want my content to be available. I'll be pretty upset if I try and access something and, it, and it's not there. Second of all, I want it pretty quick. I'm a very impatient user. And I actually want to be able to access my content wherever I am and, and on my multiple devices that I own. So would you agree? And actually, um, you know, if I want to do some online shopping, if I go to an online retailer to buy something, if their site was down, I wouldn't care, I'd just go and log on to another site and, and buy it somewhere else. And another example, if I've got photos stored in cloud storage somewhere, I'm going to be pretty upset if I couldn't access them for any reason. In fact, I'd be worried about them being lost. So these types of what I'd term the new world applications, and in fact not really new because I've been using these for a long time, as I'm, as I'm sure it is for you as well. And if we were to try and design one of these types of applications, um, using traditional um, type of architecture, it might look something like this. So we have our shared storage, so the NAS shown here, and this is actually because we have multiple app servers so that we can scale for the amount of users. And typically we have our end user who will send a request to the load balancer, and then the load balancer will go to one of the app servers. The app server will then use a database for its metadata and store the files in a NAS. So this is what a traditional architecture at a very high level might look like. So let's think about what the challenges are uh, with this type of design. The first thing is around the NAS. So um, from a scalability perspective, when that gets full, we're going to need to upgrade or migrate to a newer, larger platform, which can require quite a lot of uh, planning and potentially some downtime as well. Next up, I want it to always be available. And in this current design, if the NAS, or in fact the whole site were to go down, this would be a problem. Therefore, if we want to protect against site failure, in this type of design, it would require having a secondary site with the same setup. However, we know it's not possible to read write to the NAS platform from both sites. Therefore, the infrastructure not just the NAS, but also all of the app servers, sat there idle. It also means that if we were to make any changes to the app servers in the primary site, then we'd also need to make the same changes in the secondary site, which not only is it time consuming, but there's also a potential risk that the changes aren't exactly the same. And it's actually these reasons that mean that IT aren't always 100% confident that if the application um, were to have a, sorry, if there were to be a failover, then the application might not continue to work. Also, in this type of design, the storage admins, or in fact the application owners, need to know how much storage they're going to need, because we need to allocate storage to this particular application. And actually, the majority of the time, the application owners have no clue. They don't know what it's going to grow to, so it will be a guess, and then they'll double it. So it's frustrating that we actually need to know the capacity on a per application basis and it often results in low utilisation um, or even just management difficulties of the storage. Finally, this structure is difficult for application developers. So, you know, if an application is going to have millions of files, which is very, very normal these days, it would need to have multiple directories. So as a developer, I need to be aware of that structure and I actually need to write additional code because we need to do things like checking capacity, navigating between directories, etc, etc. So if we relate back to the three things I said that I wanted as a consumer, 
first of all, always available. So we talked a minute ago about the challenge of the secondary site and the, the confidence that IT have in, in it continuing to work in the event of a, an outage. Second of all, performance. So in a traditional NAS world, scaling the capacity and the performance can actually be quite challenging. And the fact that if I want to access from any location, in this scenario, there's only one active site. So if I were to try and access from somewhere across the other side of the world, it may actually have an uh, impact on the response time as well. And if I want to access from a specific device, I also need to specifically design an application for me to make sense of the data that's stored. So how does object solve these challenges? So the first thing is that every site is active, and that's because the storage is active on every site. So an object can be read and written from multiple different sites, and I'll come on to why that is in a moment. Next up, object storage is linearly scalable. So there is no file system management, there's no requirement to know the application specific capacity requirements up front. And um, with object, the capacity planning is now actually done at the infrastructure level rather than on a per application basis, making not only our life as a, as a storage admin, but also as an application developer's life a lot easier. So now we thought about why object is becoming more relevant and the types of challenges in the traditional architecture. This now makes it a bit easier for us to actually explain what object storage is. So first thing, self-descriptive. So what I mean by that is the fact that it is independent of the application. So we don't actually need an operating system and we don't need an application to be able to make sense of the data. So I can actually access my content, so whether that be a PDF file or a JPEG image, directly from the browser. So next up, linear scalability. And this is just because it's simpler than traditional file storage. So there's no need to create or manage volumes, there's no such things as RAID, and there's no hierarchy. Every object exists at the same level in a flat address space called the storage pool. So each object is assigned a unique identifier which allows us to retrieve that object without needing to know the physical location of where the data is stored. And it's this reduced overhead of managing the data that enables this massive scalability. In fact, I heard a, a good analogy which uh, helped, I think, explain this when I very first started to under, understand and get my head around object. And um, for those of you that have ever been to, a, to an airport car park where you just drop off your key, um, you go on holiday, and then when you come back, um, you don't actually need to care or worry about where your car was parked, how many times it was moved, because when you come back, you hand over either your receipt or your unique identifier, and you get your car back. And uh, I quite like that analogy with the, the concept of an object having a unique identifier. We have no clue where it's stored, but we can still get our data back. So globally accessible, um, there's no concept of mount points, no firewall limitations. I can access my data from any location. It's also extensible. So in other words, um, it's the ability to be able to take future requirements into consideration. This is because the data and the metadata is separate, meaning that we can easily add additional metadata. So, for example, uh, I might want to enrich my data to set policies such as retention or maybe where or where it can't be stored due to compliance reasons. Geoscale. So here I'm talking about the ability to store objects globally, so having multiple sites around the globe. And we need to think about the efficiency. So if we were to have four sites and we want to be able to access our data from all four sites, um, we don't want to have four copies of the data because that would have massive overhead. So um, one of the things about object storage is the fact that it is geoscale and we can have efficient storage with max resilience and reliability without inflating the overhead. And Viper Object actually has a unique way of doing this. Um, most of our competitors use what we term uh, distributed erasure coding, but Viper Object does not use that. It uses its own unique way of storing and protecting data, something that I won't go into detail in now, 
but I probably will on, on another white book. Highly paralysed. So this is the fact that there are no locks on right operations. And actually this goes back to what I said earlier with regards to the fact that the storage is active on every site. And that is because the object is append only, meaning that we're never going to try and overwrite some existing data. So this is what gives us the ability for hundreds of thousands of, of writers distributed all over the world to write simultaneously. So none of them need to know about each other and their behavior won't impact others. So if we're to summarize and uh, consider the so what, so why is object storage so relevant? As with most things, reducing cost, Object removes the need for the passive infrastructure. All infrastructure can now be utilised. There's no more effort of managing NAS limitations and we're making uh, not only our storage admins but our app developers' lives a lot easier. Next, big smiley face there, increasing confidence to the business. So we really have a true active-active um, architecture, meaning that we do protect against site failure. So in the event of a outage, we're still going to have all of those three things that I said are important to me as a consumer. And finally, meeting the demands of impatient users just like myself. So performance is no longer a concern. There are no limitations as the data grows. I hope that was useful. Thank you very much for listening.